I am Mischievous Mole. I am one of the coordinators of SL21B, and I'm going to be here hosting today a talk with Lindens from um, production and marketing. So can you hear me? <laughs> Hi, everybody. All right. The voice tech voice check is successful. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the first of several town hall events. Through the end of the week, we'll be chatting with various Linden Lab executives and team members. You can all hear me, right? All three regions. All right. Through the end of the week, we'll be chatting with various Linden Lab executives and team members to learn more about the past, present, and future of Second Life. Be sure to join us later this week for opportunities to hear from our product operations team, the Moles, and even Second Life founder, Philip Rosedale. Then, next Monday, July 1st, we're pleased to welcome Linden Lab Executive Chairman Oberman Linden and Senior Vice President of Product Operations and Marketing, Patch Linden, for our second community roundtable. For today, we are pleased to be joined by several key members of the product and engineering teams. Topics on tap today include updates on our mobile app, creator tools, viewer improvements, and much more. With us today, our Senior Vice President of Product and Engineering, Grumpity Linden, Director of Engineering, Web and Platform, Kali Linden, Director of Engineering, Second Life Server and Viewer, Signal Linden, Senior Product Manager, Syntax Linden, and Product Manager, Kyle Linden. Now, before we jump into the community submitted questions, can each of you share a little bit about who you are, what you do at Linden Lab, and why you love working with Second Life? Um, we'll start on the left. Kali, what do you have to say? Hi, Mischievous. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Kali Linden. I've been at the lab about nine years. I am the director of the web and tools and platform teams, which means that uh, I run the teams that run marketplace and web search and uh, accounts and login and uh, the teams that underpin all of that and help Second Life keep running and us keep observing it. Um, I love working here because when things go weird, uh, we are family. We we really pitch in together and uh, help each other out, which is great. And weird is a side effect of awesome. And Second Life is both of those things. And both our Linden and our resident communities are pretty great. So it's kind of a wonderful place to be. Well, I agree wholeheartedly with you, Kali. <laughs> Signal. Hey. Yeah. So uh, I'm Signal. I'm a former software engineer, current suffering manager, and I have been obsessed with virtual worlds for a long time. Um, I originally back, you know, I was working with text-based um, MUs, MUX, MASHs, etc. I use Second Life as part of a new media art uh, medium for in high school and college. So like I built this giant screen with all of these virtual worlds. You could log into different ones in my garage. Um, it's been a real passion area and I was really excited to be able to join Linden Lab in 2015 when I started working on Sansar. Um, I think virtual worlds are able to push the envelope of human experience by being these crazy mediums where you can build new things and experiment with yourself and experiment with um, content and do all these, you know, fun, novel things. It's like brilliant to be able to talk to everyone and socialize and have some place where it's, um, you know, a really creative medium. So that's why I love doing 
what I do. And I'm in charge of the server and viewer teams. So the engineering side of things, I'm really passionate about open source. And so I'm really happy to talk with you today and hear everyone's questions. All right, thank you so much. Grumpity, what do you have to say? Hi, um, I am the senior VP of product and engineering. Uh, which means that I kind of stick my fingers into a lot of things um, and I know a little bit about a lot of things and uh, hopefully a few things fairly well. Um, I've been around Second Life for uh, 15 years and um, it feels like uh, just yesterday I still sometimes feel like a total noob, um, which is I think an amazing thing about a cell. Uh, I love that I continue learning new things and kind of expanding my horizons. And SL is always surprising me. Um, sometimes, you know, we're all old and weathered and we're like, oh, I bet we know what's going to happen and we can predict how, you know, some features that we're working on will be used. Um, and then every time um, you all just blow us out of the water uh, with your creativity and um, persistence and commitment and love for this world. And so all we can do is try to live up to your expectations. Well, you certainly do a wonderful job doing that, at least from my my view of things. I, I think that you all have given us an amazing world to be able to be creative in because from what I understand, you all are basically the ones who have created a platform for us to be here and be creative in. Thank you. Um, I think we're just the stewards of it. Uh, it is uh, a forever living thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, so a living and evolving thing, right? Absolutely. Syntax. Introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Syntax Linden. I am a product manager at Second Life, and I am specifically focused on improving commerce in Second Life uh, and any of our many web properties. Uh, so that could be anything from the web marketplace to the dashboard. Uh, and I really love working at the lab because it really is one of the most unique experiences out there. Uh, no two days are alike, uh, and I have the privilege of being able to directly interact with residents and creators on a daily basis and see what new things they're doing in the world. Uh, and it is a lot of fun. All right, thank you so much. And Kyle, finally, last but not least. Hi, Mischievous, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Kyle Linden, I'm product manager and uh, my area of uh, coverage is our creator tools. Um, I have been here over 17 years now. I, I've moved around. I've had the opportunity to have experience and interact with almost every aspect of, of Second Life, both internally and externally. Um, so that's why I'm very happy and passionate to be focusing on our creator tools, because that's my favorite part about Second Life is, is the fun of creation. And the freedom that we have here is just really greater than any normal game. And, and though I might consider myself a gamer, um, I, you don't have the, the freedom in console games that you do in Second Life, and that's why I just can't see myself uh, being anywhere else. Thank you all very much for taking a few minutes and just telling us a little bit about yourselves. It sounds like you've all been very invested in Second Life for a long time and that you that you do get out and you, you are involved with the residents and involved with the creators and it's really exciting to for me to be here talking with you all today this is an area of second life that i'm not really familiar with and i know that there have been some really exciting advances that have come to the platforms since the last birthday and so there are a lot of questions that the community has for you and we can get started on those uh, the first topic that we are going to um, talk about are creator tools. And we saw a lot of questions come in about creator tools. Um, many of the creators have questions about variety of aspects related to 
how and when our creator tools will continue to evolve. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Kyle, are there any plans or ideas to help creators learn to create better content and educate them on the various limits of computer graphic technologies and to make them aware of limitations so that they're creating better content? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, our community is one of our greatest strengths. And so what we'd like to do is think about ways to spotlight and recognize those creators. Um, they give back to the community sometimes by creating videos, guides, um, or even teaching in-world classes. And uh, rather than reinvent that wheel, so to speak, let's, let's focus on those who are already teaching best practices to uh, others. And that said, it is absolutely an opportunity for us to improve uh, our own documentation. Some of it is aged, and we uh, will ship features um, sometimes before the documentation update. And uh, we, we want to improve that. OK, so uh, my question, and, and I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I, I know that there are creators out there that are making tutorials um, and teaching classes. Do we have a place? Is there a central location um, where someone who's interested in finding out that information can go and look? Or is that something that we need to put together? <laughs> I, I believe that's something that we're going to try and build together. Okay. Well, that's exciting because um, I do know that of some creators out there personally that have done that, and that would be a great thing for maybe Strawberry to organize and put together and, and feature somewhere on the website. Absolutely. We have so many amazing creators. All right. Um, the next question. When are more bones coming for mesh clothing? Or please improve the engine for mesh clothing. So there's some questions about rigging for mesh clothing and how to make it better. Yeah, I can respond to that. So I mean, like mesh clothing is it, like the, the process of creating mesh clothing is like a really advanced um, uh, endeavor. Like, you know, I've I've made rigged clothing before rig attachments it's non-trivial um, you have to know a ton of information about like second life and then a ton of information about like the tool you're using or if you're using blender you'll need a plugin to make it easier to import content in the second life and so i don't have an answer to like when are more bones coming specifically to like the second life skeleton and so i'll, I'll, I'll twist my answer to come out with the statement that i want to say um, <laughs> which is that we, we're, we're working on making it a lot simpler to bring content into Second Life so that making mesh clothing is simpler. And so, you know, it's totally amazing. I'm blown away every day by what people are building in Second Life and like the professional quality content that I see and everyone around here. And something we really wanna do is reduce the barrier to producing that content by eliminating limitations and making it simpler to import it. And the means we're going to use to accomplish this is embracing modern content standards. So the GLTF model import um, work that's underway, probably most prominently. You know, we want people to be able to take content and drag and drop it into Second Life so it's not a incredibly complex process. Now, once we have, you know, down the road, like full GLTF model import support built out, that means, you know, custom armatures, it means uh, things that were never possible in Second Life before. Another thing that we'd like to enable that'll make it simpler to bring clothing into Second Life is, you know, local mesh preview. You know, some third party uh, viewers have local mesh preview and that feature is really powerful to be able to like, you know, see exactly what the content's gonna look like when you bring it into Second Life. We wanna have something similar to that for GLTF import. And you can get a preview of that in some of our beta um, clients that we have on our, our beta grid at DD. Well, that sounds like a wonderful thing for clothing designers to be able to look at mesh before they actually import it and see it on the avatar and how it fits and works and moves, right? Is that, 
Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, currently when you import mesh, you get kind of a more preview window when you're using the official viewer and you don't get to see exactly what the content's going to look like. But that type of notion of seeing exactly what the content looks like is going to be kind of like a theme for if you're using a tool like Substance Painter or Blender, we'd like it to be able to look, you know, like that tool in second, like you see in that tool in Second Life. So it doesn't go through any type of like conversion process that results in something that's dramatically different than what you're building in your content authoring software. Wow, that's, that's going to be exciting. Something to look forward to. Um, this next question's for you too. Can we expand the tools to allow animations to have priority changed or change smoothly in and out through editing them? This could allow for better usage of animations in a way that should affect no animators. Yeah, I, I, I love this idea. It's come up like, you know, this is one of those like perennial issues that we have that I'm actually, I really love trying to bring up to the top of a priority queue and, and work on. Um, because, you know, if you work with Second Life animations or, you know, or even fussing with your AO, like you'll run into these problems with animation priority conflicts, right? Like this animation is a higher priority than that one and you want it to be the opposite. Um, so I could say it's on the roadmap and if you vote for uh, at feed, on our feedback portal, feedback.secondlife.com, that'll help us remember how important it is. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways to improve animation and like, you know, it could be something simple, like, hey, we add a new script function that makes it possible to set the animation priority in addition to playing it. Um, there's, you know, other features that can help improve animation, like different animation import formats that we could support. Um, putting those ideas into our feedback portal, portal really helps us prioritize which ones are important. Okay, so if if people want to see certain things kind of pushed to the front or implement, implemented, what they really ought to be doing is using that feedback portal to let you know what they're interested in. And that doesn't guarantee anything, but it lets you know what people are really interested in having you work on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, you know, a work in progress as we explore how to organize ideas in that portal. You know, we just launched it earlier this year, but the reception has been overwhelming in terms of the amount of ideas we have pouring in. Um, and what I always like is like, even if you have an idea in your head that is like, well, I've had this idea since, um, you know, you know, insert some year beginning with a two zero 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 or something like, please add to that because we've been actually implementing a lot of those. Um, for example, with scripting, there are just some basic things like, hey, why can't I change the, why can't I sort a list better or manipulate this data type? And, you know, we're, we're trying to implement those as fast as we can. Well, there are only five of you here. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of people in Second Life. So I'm sure that all of them, even a small portion of them, giving you ideas does help because it's, it's hard sometimes to come up with all of the ideas that everybody needs. Now, I will put this out there because um, Signal just spoke about this. The website that you can um, put your ideas into, it's feedback.secondlife.com. So if you have an idea, that's where you wanna go so that you can send it to these guys so that they can take a look at it. And I have one more question for you, Signal. <laughs> It is, um, do you have a timeline for 2K GLTF materials on the mainland train and 2K textures for bomb? These additions will have a huge impact visually on Second Life. So it's really exciting to know that they're on the horizon. Do you have an idea of how far <laughs> out they are or are they getting close? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a, like, I don't have an ex exact date for like the 2K textures and mainland, but sooner rather than later, that means like, you know, we're thinking, you know, 
weeks, not not months, um, is from what I understand. That, now, I may be, you know, maybe people instant message me and, and scream in my ear that that's totally wrong. But I would s suggest that we you take that question to the product ops team um, meeting that we have coming up, because they would be able to give a kind of better, you know, better explain all the process that's, you know, the process that's involved updating mainland number one. Anytime you make a change to mainland, it's just huge, right? So we need to consider and really make sure that the right changes are being made uh, if they're impacting all the textures across all of mainland. Um, and regarding bakes on mesh, um, you know, speaking of that feedback portal, uh, getting 2K texture support for bakes on mesh is currently the number one voted issue um, on feedback.secondlife.com. And I totally get that because you want to see really high resolution textures on your avatar. Um, you know, it's kind of always feels a little antiquated when you're dealing with 1024 um, with something as important as uh, your avatar's, you know, skin and tattoos and whatnot. So that is planned. We'd like to start working on it pretty soon. Um, and that would also bring in PBR support to uh, bake set mesh so you can use physics based uh, materials. Okay, I do. I do have a question. I understand how this would visually enhance things if you're talking about baked on mesh, because it, what it'll do is it'll define like a tattoo. It would make it more defined, right? If you're using a higher resolution of graphic, that the tattoo itself would be more defined. What what does it mean for mainland textures? What's that going to look like? I mean, can you can you describe to me how that might visually enhance mainland, or is it something that I just have to see in order to experience? Mm -hmm. Well, I would really recommend you take a look on um, either a region that already has 2K textures, or if you look on our blog, I think it's a featured blog post that have some 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 images. Um, it looks like mind-bogglingly good in terms of if you're used to seeing these kind of like super fuzzy low resolution like grass textures throughout Second Life. And then 2K textures just provide this incredible clarity and uh, like visual fidelity to, you know, you can see tiny little grass um, uh, blades and rock and the PBR means that you know reflections and the normal maps. You know it looks looks amazing, and you know developers and the render team have done a fantastic job of improving the way that these patches of terrain textures blend and tile. So that previously in Second Life, when you used to like have a giant, um, really steep slope, it would kind of stretch out the texture, and it would look mm -hmm. like this you know stretched out texture. Um, and that should look way better now. Uh, and we're also working on improving more. Um, I think we're going to have some 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 more changes to that in the future, but um, to improve that the tiling. But you know, PBR also means you get emissive support, so you can have glowing, you know, glowing lava and stuff like oh, that. Oh wow! <laughs> It's pretty cool. Well, we could have definitely used that. We have some lava regions here, and we were scratching our head on exactly how to make that look as authentic as possible and i think we did a good job but it sounds like this would make it even even more impressive yeah. you said that there are places that i can go and that actually have 2k um, textures on them already train textures where are those places I, I, can we give some landmarks or swirls or something if people want to go check those out or I think we do and I think we can post some um in, in local chat. Yeah. It's easier than me saying a slurl yes, out. Yes, yes, definitely than you saying a slurl out loud that doesn't really work, right? All right, let's see. Um I have a question for Kyle now. Wind Whisper Snowpaw asks. Um, is there a roadmap to create, maintain, and document frameworks for 
number of things here. Um, status and conditions beyond what can be simulated by RLV. Region-wide variables for questing and object scripting. Damage and user-created tools for crafting engaging experiences. Thank you. That is such a great question. And uh, yeah, this is exactly what the Creator Tools initiative is all about. Um, with one of my uh, most favorite features that's coming down the road, uh, Combat 2.0, um, we're going to see a huge update that the old Linden Damage has never had in a very, very long time. And they're going to provide status updates and feedback like your shields are taking damage, your you're taking poison damage, that kind of thing. It's no longer just the the uh, one bullet and you're dead and uh, you teleport home. Um, it's going to be much more complex and immersive. Uh, other things that we're adding to that will be Linden structured data, um, gamepad control, so you can grab your Xbox controller and uh, and interact with Second Life that way. Um, Further is WebRTC that's going to have some scripted sounds um, and just more things that will help create fun experiences um, in Second Life along with all of our other existing tools and features. All right, thank you. Signal, um, another question. LUA scripting language is currently being integrated client side. Are there also plans to implement this as a server scripting link, server scripting language as well? Yeah, this would be the big question. We've got some members, some regular members of the server user group hanging out in the crowd, which are all whispering Lua. Um, I knew you would be here teasing me. Um, before before answering that question, I'd like to give a bit of a backstory on scripting in Second Life for anyone that might not be familiar. Um, Second Life scripting, you know, it, it it's a single language, Linden scripting language, but it has these two different runtimes. So, like when you're writing a script, you can choose to run it as in one mode or the other. The older runtime LSO two, you know, that's the bytecode code it runs. You know, goes back to the early 2000s near to Second Life's you know launch. Um, and then in 2008, uh, Babbage Linden and a bunch of other folks wrote out this major enhancement to scripting, which was the mono runtime. So that provided this like amazing leap in uh, performance over the original virtual machine. Um, so you may have noticed it's been a bit since 2008. Um, but during that time, you know, we really haven't done much to LSL outside of introducing like new functions, like you know this new functionality of Linden structured data, uh, you know, ways to manipulate data types. Um, those are all changes to the like the library, um, and not really changes to the core language. And part of the philosophy that I see a lot of folks. Um, inside the company starting to to push towards is like challenging preconceived notions about which areas of second life can and cannot change um so like yeah i'm mean, the short answer is uh what we would like to do is bring lua scripting to second life natively um this is a project in its early stages and it means that you'll be able to write you know lua for server-side scripting to control objects and you know content inside of second life um, this means that you'll be able to write natively in Lua using the full uh, existing library of LSL functionality. Um, and so like, you know, it, it, it means that you'll be able to use a lot more powerful language features. LSL was written very quickly. It's kind of a simple language. It's missing kind of some kind of like fundamental things like map types and, um, you know, just basic, you know, typing and, first class functions. Um, but bringing native Lua to Second Life isn't all that we're doing. The approach here is that we're actually going to be running, in addition to native Lua, we'll be able to replace Mono with the um, 
Lua runtime in the back end. What that means is that we'll be able to run mono scripts even, or what used to be mono scripts even faster. Um, what we've seen in kind of some initial benchmarks is that um, it uses less memory and the Lua VM is faster than the mono uh, scripts. Um, this will mean that content creators have more memory to play with, with their scripts. Um, and it also means that um, they'll be able to, you know, just, you know, just run simply faster. Um, so like timeline wise, you know, we'll be releasing more information in the coming months. It's very much an early time. The results so far have been pretty promising. Um, I'm sure the next week's server user group will be pretty exciting. So Lua is a scripting language like LSL, but it sounds like Lua is, is easier to write and more powerful. I would say it's it's definitely there's definitely more documentation in Lua than there is in LSL, right? Like there's um it's used by some other platforms um and it's used a lot in the game industry. Uh there's a lot of like documentation spread throughout um you know the internet or you know how to write how to write monoscripts. It's also just has a lot more functionality. Okay, so if I wanted to write something, I would probably be able to find more tutorials or examples of how to write something than I might currently be able to do with LSL. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there are a lot of re resources for LSL and it's kind of like, a, you know, Second Life has this colossal wiki, which has, it's like, I use it every single day to reference like LSL documentation, right? And we've had these, now 21 years of history of scripts. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, Lua is used outside of Second Life, right? It's used by a bunch of things. So there's a bunch of documentation on it. Well, I, I know the wiki that you're talking about. I don't know anything about scripting at all, but occasionally I'll want to do something that is <laughs> I need a script for. And I find that wiki incredibly useful because I can go there and I can just find exactly what I want and copy paste it. And then I have a script and I didn't even have to do anything except look in the wiki. <laughs> yeah, so you thank you to 21 years worth of people adding things to that wiki to help all us people that don't know how to script a tomato. <laughs> all right, yeah. um, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, don't, I just didn't know what a, what a, a tomato what a script a tomato would have, but now I'm interested. I don't so. know. No, I, I, maybe an exploding tomato. There you go. All right. Um, let's move on to a PBR. <laughs> a few questions came in about this. Um, physically based rendering that's more commonly known as PBR. I have a question. Signal, you're <laughs> still on the hot seat here. Are yeah. there going to be any improvements to optimize PBR in Second Life? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, like PBR, with PBR just being kind of released by a lot of, um, you know, some new third party viewers, Firestorm, et cetera, um, you know, an SLB being built out using PBR content exclusively you know, we're working really hard on performance optimizations right now. Like right now the graphics team is kind of, um, uh, you know, all jumping on improving, optimizing performance, crushing bugs. You know, like one example was, you know, we found out we were recalculating bounding boxes uh, too frequently, every single frame that was fixed um, by a, a outside contributor. Um, we're also looking at memory use. We have this huge list of, other items that we'd like to tackle um, to make PBR performance better. And so, you know, um, one of the things that we understand is that by introducing physics-based rendering, uh, we're changing people's worlds, right? Like the lighting changes, and it's like this huge impact. Um, and PBR is like the biggest change to Second Life's rendering since the introduction of like materials and EAP. It allows creators to work in this, you know, idiomatic way with modern physics-based tools like Substance Painter. It's like a real, it's a real game changer. 
Um, and I really believe that the only reason that Second Life is successful as it is today is because of the hard work that went into rolling out changes like materials, EEP, Animesh, et cetera, before. Like, um, I think that there's going to be a little bit of growing pain, but we're really trying to be responsive to people's feedback. And that uh, with PBR and the GLTF work that's happening now, Second Life will look amazing and, you know, 10, 20 years from now. And so, uh, you know, we're not a traditional platform. We're rolling out changes, you know, relatively frequently. We have a huge backlog, right? So it may seem like, gosh, um, you know, we're, we're never getting to a certain issue, but we're shipping new viewer releases, you know, every, every like few, few weeks and, you know, every like you know month or two, which is actually pretty fast. And so, we have a lot of concerted effort on PBR right now. Um, so, uh, you know, we want to hear your feedback. And so, of course, I can plug the feedback portal again, but uh, I think I've already done that enough. You know, you know, we're looking to do things like improve uh, the, you know, the mainlands, you know, EAP settings, perhaps we're exploring options at, you know, adjusting defaults and making the performance better. Well, I know that um, as a mole, I've been hearing about PBR for easily a year, if not longer. And I'm not a content creator, so I wasn't I wasn't working hands on with it. But putting the birthday together, we um, did everything is PBR, and it's just so amazing to me how crisp and realistic everything looks. I, I know there was some concrete that was done on one of the exhibits and I was looking at it in um, a non PBR wind light. I was like off the parcel and the people that I were with kept saying, it looks so amazing. It looks so amazing. I'm like, yeah, it looks like concrete. And I took a few steps <laughs> and I walked into the parcel so that the wind light changed to a PBR wind light. And all of a sudden, it I was looking at the cement and it looked like I could feel it. I mean, it looked like literally if I if I reached out, I could touch it and I would feel how rough it was. And th that's just, it's an absolutely amazing sensation to be able to go around and see that. So that's what PBR is. And that is really cool. So thank you all for working so incredibly hard to, to make this place even more realistic for us. Yeah, I, I really have to thank the team. Um, and it's also been a collaborative project on the beta grid. Uh, of, you know, early adopters have really helped us. And, you know, now we're all early adopters. And so um, we're looking to, you know, make the, you know, continue to make the process really easy to bring in content and do things like use modern tools, you know, Blender, use it, make it simpler to use, Substance, uh, other, you know, and open source tools in addition to that. Well, from what I understand, creators are really, really excited about this, being able to use, to create things in things like Blender and Substance Painter and, then be able to bring them into Second Life and have them look almost exactly like, if not exactly like what they created in these external programs. So from my creator friends, they're very, very excited. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And it's also, you know, kind of important to note that, you know, PBR materials is, is one step towards this uh, bigger plan to make it like dead simple to bring in content to Second Life to author content. Um, so that's like the material side of things. Um, but what we really want to do is adopt the GLTF standard and so that um, you know bringing entire models can be done like whole hierarchies of content, drag and drop that into Second Life. Wow. Um, so yeah, that should be simpler than cobbling things together um, or you know, dealing with limits. All right, all things to look forward to in the future. Um, 
There is a question here about addressing PBR enabled version of the official viewer. You need to have that to log in to Second Life now. Um, does Linden Lab intend to address viewer performance on the Mac OS? And if that's the case, when could Mac OS users expect to see those improvements? Yeah, so, so like I mentioned, we're, we're uh, we have a bunch of folks working on performance improvements now, and so we're doing an optimization pass uh, targeting mid-range hardware. So that's like a you know, eight hundred US dollar PC or an M2 Mac. Um, you know, specifically on the Mac, we're looking at memory issues, and like textural load problems that we're aware of. And so, yeah, we're aware of those and we're working on them. Okay. Okay, so one more, one more thing, Signal, before we move on to the next topic. Is there anything else that you want to let the community know about PBR? Um, well, gosh, I feel like I, I talked about <laughs> talked like a ton about it yeah uh you know the features you know I, I haven't mentioned like you know gosh we got mirrors you know uh we talked about 2k terrain um working on 2k textures and pbr and bakes on mesh um and like uh yeah this is this is one step towards uh a bigger vision of making it easy to make content in second life easier okay well lots of exciting things either here or rolling out, approaching on the horizon. So next birthday, um, we should have even more exciting things to talk about, it sounds like. All right, um, everybody who is sitting out there in the audience, you might be thinking of some questions. I don't know that we're actually gonna have time because we still have quite a few questions to get through, but if you think of something, go ahead and message Squeaky. He is collecting questions from the audience and if we have time, we'll get to those once we've gotten through this list that we've already collected. All right, moving on to the viewer, we've got some um, questions specifically about features and developments with the Second Life viewer. Kyle, this one's for you. Are there any new features coming out that we aren't already aware of or that are planned beyond what has already been announced? Uh, that's a great question. I, we are, are very open with the community about our development roadmap, so I, I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, tricks up my sleeve uh, or surprises. But just to kind of recap some of the things we've already discussed and some of the things we might not yet have mentioned. Obviously, Lua, uh, Combat 2.0, Gamepad support, um, HDR, HDRI skies. Uh, the GLTF full scene import, obviously 2K textures are out, um, but bringing those to mainland, as was said before, and uh, one of the other things we want to add, though, is more sample content to the library. Um, mirrors are tricky uh, to figure it out if you've never done it before, so we want to add some sample mirrors, maybe some sample lights, uh, and maybe even update uh, the deep skies and environments that are provided in the library. So, and all of that's kind of simmering right now. All right, sounds like a lot of things that are simmering. Um, specific question from Sarah, Sarah Buxo. She says she's wondering um, about SL and the chat system that Second Life currently uses. It's pretty old and it doesn't seem to have a emojis included and she's wondering if you know we're ever going to get emojis more than like a sideways sideways smiley face oh of, of course i mean uh, that's the good news i think everyone's probably already seen them I, I see some right there in chat we do have emoji support in the viewer um we we shipped that in in march and the good news is wherever we support unicode in the viewer you can uh, place emojis. Uh, there are still um, a few places where we're a little shy to enable emojis for just yet. One of example is display names. Uh, we're exploring that option. 
Um, but, you know, it turns out storing Unicode in databases has some risks. So we just need to make sure we're doing everything right before we roll out emoji support any further. Okay, so I didn't actually know that we had emoji support. How do, if I'm typing something and I want to use like a smiley face emoji, how do I do that? Well, there's, there's a couple of options. Um, you can start with a colon and then start typing a word. It's a similar method that a lot of other chat programs use to suggest emojis. Or if you look down in your conversation window, you'll see a little smiley face guy there in the right corner, and that will expand your emoji menus. And oh my you gosh! Can pick from there. I just learned something new. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> of course. All right. Um, Signal, <laughs> I have another question for you. I feel like we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation here. Um, when is the web RTC support project projected to be available? And yeah. how are security concerns like leaking of IP addresses going to be mitigated with that? Right, that's a great question. Um, so WebRTC Voice, for anyone not familiar, is a pretty ambitious project we have that kind of like with the scripting project, um, you know, we want to kind of challenge any type of preconceptions about things not being able to change. Um, and so we are planning on kind of rolling our own voice solution that will result in, you know, clear, higher fidelity voice when you move between parcels the connection should be faster um this is being you know worked on by the server team kind of spearheaded by roxy linden um who has some pretty great experience working on um uh web rtc and real-time audio and so uh there is a release candidate viewer that you can try out now if you go to releasenotes.secondlife.com that viewer is compatible with both the new voice and uh, the Vivox voice regions. Um, so you should be able to use that on all of uh, the main grid and beta grids. Um, there are some WebRTC regions here on a little channel that we have deployed. We search for WebRTC on the map. Uh, they should come up. Now, switching the entire grid over to WebRTC voice is going to require some pretty ambitious collaboration, especially with uh, when we need to coordinate with third party viewers. Um, you know, they've been pretty amazing partners so far. I think like everyone wants to see Second Life Voice improved, you know, kind of fundamentally. And, you know, this means that we're, we're going to need to coordinate. So we're aiming for quarter three, 2024, to roll out the new system. Um, the other question was about security, right? Like whether yes. your IP, yeah, like whether your IP will be exposed. And that comes up because people are used to hearing about WebRTC in the context of like peer-to-peer -peer direct like computer-to-computer -computer voice chat sessions. And uh, in this case, we put uh, we put um, we put audio through a relay so that you, you you know your IP will never be exposed to another user through the WebRTC voice system. Um, so that means you should be protected from, you know, information leaking like your your computer's address. Um, there's also some other security improvements that come with using, you know, our, our own WebRTC uh, system. Um, and, uh, you know, some of those are like, because we're bringing voice in world, right, or, or in house, we can actually do things like process the audio. So. This is all like far, you know, a little bit far in the future. We're focused on rolling this out right now, but you know, we could entertain the idea for for features like, um, you know, defining a certain area to have echo, or um, having scripts control audio or dynamically create audio. Those are all kind of some some ideas that people have uh, workshopped before. I love it when you give examples like that and because you you're talking about these things and most of them go over my head but then you say but some areas will be able to have echoes and i'm like cool <laughs> yep and i mean so yeah and to be clear we're working on like i think the thing that people notice first and foremost is that 
you know, that the audio should be better quality, right? If you're talking in voice in the world, okay. you know, that's what you're going to get for this release. Everything else is kind of, you know, it's ideas in our heads, their dreams, their aspirations, um, features that we'd like to work on. But right now, uh, hopefully the really improved audio quality should be better. So, so it should, oh yeah. Maybe ahead. next year, next year, we will be using voice in world for these talks. Hey, that's an idea. <laughs> All right, let's see, what is our next question? Um, we have a question from Brian Topp uh, for Kyle, I think is probably the best one to answer this. There's been an issue for a long time concerning alpha masking and land resets, which ends up changing the alpha mask number back to zero and it deforms the texture. Can this issue be fixed? That is a very great and timely question. I, this bug has plagued me for a long time too. I fought with it when I was doing QA. Um, the, the good news is um, we may have finally discovered where it is breaking. Um, not to get super technical, but the short version is if the diffuse map is reporting that anything is missing, then the viewer will set the alpha mode to none. And so if the current viewer has mod permissions over that, it will absolutely do that and change it to none. So we just need to fix that so that it no longer changes it to none, um, regardless of having mod per permissions or not, if it is falsely reporting that that asset is missing. So there is a GitHub issue open for it. And as some of you may know, and those that don't, our viewer repo on GitHub is public, and that is issue 1641 on GitHub, and we are working on it. All right. I have another question for you. Um, this is from Hybrid90 Resident, and they say that they are completely blind. Um, but they use Second Life with a third-party tool to access the platform. And that Second Life gives them a way to experience things that they can't in real life. And so they wonder if there are any plans to incorporate assistive technology accessibility into the main Second Life viewer so that third-party tools are not necessarily needed. Yeah, this, this is also another question that I really care about. Um, I love that Second Life can provide a virtual world to so many different humans on planet Earth uh, of different needs. Um, so some of the work we've been doing over the past couple of years have been helping us build the, the groundwork and foundation for providing more accessibility features. One of the ones coming sooner than later will be uh, server-side translation. Um, some other things we can do once WebRTC is out across the grid full is it'll be more performant and then that will allow for more client-side extensions that could do things like text-to-speech and speech-to-text. Um, and we, we may even um, leverage some AI to help with, with that kind of thing as well. Um, exploratory for sure um and any and all suggestions that would help us make second life more accessible we we want to know uh we know there's more that we can do um please give us that feedback i, I know we've we've said this already but that's feedback.secondlife.com um give us your ideas now, I know that when I was talking, meeting with all of you yesterday to to kind of go over these questions, I think what you were saying was possibly a way that this um, works is it reads off the, the names of the objects. And a problem is that there's a lot of things that are named objects, so the, it the text doesn't necessarily become very descriptive. So if if creators are better at naming things what they actually are, that might be helpful in being able to set things up for assistive technology. Yeah, absolutely. N nobody wants to walk into a messy room full of objects. 
<laughs> right. It says, well, object here on top of object next to object. And so if we if we do a better job defining, identifying what things are, that's just going to be helpful in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just kind of threw that in there. <laughs> um, one last question for you, Kyle. Uh, avatar age, can it be hidden? Some of us have been here for a very, very long time. And unless we started when we were five, it, that makes us look like we're probably in our 40s or 50s or 60s. <laughs> Is there a way to, um, yeah, hide it so that it doesn't say that we're 17 years in Second Life? Uh, yeah, that's, that's another uh, good one. We've good news there too. We've we've got that canny uh, feedback filed, and we're we're in progress on that. Um, one way we might augment that is just to remove the year, and it would of course be opt out so that uh, users can choose how they want to display it. Cause the the res date itself is still important, right? So everybody wants to know the day to celebrate you. Right. I know personally in my real life, I have a philosophy. Um, I subtract 10% of my age every decade, but I figure that at a certain age, I'm going to start adding that back because if I get to be like 75, 80, 90 years old, then I want to own that. I want people to know that I'm 90 years old and not 81 when I'm 90. That, you know, so. Sometimes you do want your age to be known, right? Yeah, so freedom freedom of choice there. Um, Signal, before we move to the next topic, is there anything else you would like the community to know about the viewer? Yeah, I've been uh, you know, talking a lot, but I really wanted to take a moment to uh, specifically recognize the fact that, you know, Second Life is an open source uh, project in that we have our viewer available for basically anyone in the world to contribute to in collaboration with us. Um, we've seen a pretty marked uptick in the amount of contributions we've been getting. We moved from this platform called Bitbucket to GitHub, but we've also seen a lot, of, a lot more collaboration with outside contributors, um, like some, some basic numbers like you know at least 10 times the number of outside contributions in the same time period like it's it's pretty remarkable and you know we've done things like make all of the dependencies the viewer able to be you know built inside of like public ci cd or you know be, be built publicly and contributed to so the increased collaboration has been good and i just wanted to thank the outside contributors and anyone that like contributes to the second life code base and project. All right, thank you. Our next topic is commerce, and we're going to hear from Syntax and Kali. Um, Kali, the first question's for you. Your future waifu asks, <laughs> she um, would love to know if there's going to be two-step verification verification applied to the marketplace because she feels that an increasing number of people are being fished and it's happening through the marketplace. Yeah, um, I totally did not fight syntax for this question just because I love that name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, we are planning to add multi-factor authentication, the same one that you can sign up for in other places in Second Life to the marketplace. Um, it, to echo echo what Signal said earlier, um, I think this is um, coming very soon. I guess I don't want to put any particular dates on it, but uh, you know, I would look for it before beach season is over here in the US. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Couple of months, couple of months. Um, and you know, you have to opt in to MFA uh, to begin with. So um, if you don't want to MFA, then you don't have to, um, but it is a, a nice security feature layer addition. Um, and I believe that 
once you have uh, MFA authenticated on a particular device, then it doesn't ask you again for a little while. So um, eventually we would like to have that MFA cover all of the authentication um, endpoints options uh, for Second Life. If you opt in, you should have MFA covering you everywhere, but that requires a little bit more prep, a little bit more thought, um, and will take a little bit longer to get to. Okay, but it's nice that it's something that you can opt into um, or will be able to opt into so that if you don't want it or don't feel a necessity for it, you don't have to have it, right? Right, and you can already opt into it for a lot of pl uh, places in Second Life, anywhere that you would use your um, outside of Second Life payment method, uh, but we should be adding it to the marketplace okay. pretty soon. All right, something to look for forward to before beach weather is over. Yep. Okay, syntax. Um, I'm going to direct this question to you, but you know you can pass it off to Kali if you want to. Then the next three questions I have are all from the feedback portal. So that's at the one we've been talking about, feedback.secondlife.com. Um, will there be updates to the marketplace search to increase original stores and original product visibility? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, so our philosophy here is to support creators and merchants when it comes to the Second Life Marketplace. And we've been looking at the uh, impact of changes to search and we plan to make further changes over the next year uh, with the goal of supporting creators and more ways to promote their content uh, while not being at the detriment of merchants. Um, the Second Life economy is pretty complex and sometimes it requires us to make small changes for a limited time to see how it can kind of influence the flow of commerce. Uh, so we'll be sharing more about that in, uh, the, throughout the next year. And we definitely welcome feedback through either the web user group or our feedback portal. Okay. Um, what about the marketplace and um, the user interface for mobile or smaller screen sizes? Is that something that you're working on? Yes, uh, so we are currently working on a UI update for the Second Life Marketplace, uh, and that's gonna allow better usability on smaller or screen sizes. Uh, we think this will not only support our growing mobile user base with the Second Life uh, mobile viewer, but we also think it's gonna improve the experience when shopping on the in-viewer desktop browser. Uh, one of our biggest cohorts of uh, residents shopping on the, uh, the Marketplace are using the in-viewer desktop browser, uh, and we really wanna improve that experience. Okay. Well, I know that that's, that's the viewer I like to use because it automatically connects to my avatar. And if I'm using the, the web-based viewer in an outside browser, then I have to remember which avatar I'm buying for. <laughs> so it's nice to use the one that's in the viewer. Yeah, absolutely. All right, one more question, Kali. Um, will we get further integration with Casper Vend and the Second Life Marketplace? Uh, the very short answer is yes. Um, we are talking to Casper and looking at our roadmap and seeing what makes the most sense to do first. Uh, but there are a lot of things that we want to do to make the marketplace merchant experience and the Casper market, uh, merchant experience and shopping experiences better and more aligned. Um, I think one of the first ones we're going to try and do is get Casper deliveries through the same uh, job queue that marketplace uh, deliveries go through. That would make um, re-deliveries simpler. So, yeah. Absolutely, we want to uh, integrate those a lot better. I'd love for merchants to be able to have to only have to manage their inventory in one place, and then they could have very easily marketplace and Casper Vend, and a lot more free time to shop other yeah. merchants. It blossoms the entire Second Life economy. All right, Syntax, is um, there anything else that you want to let the community know before we move on to another topic? 
Yeah, uh, so I, I know we've been saying this a lot, but I really want to shamelessly plug our resident and creator feedback channels, whether that's via the web user group uh, or the other user groups or the Second Life feedback portal. It, it really is a big factor in our decision making. Uh, we base that on the feedback that we get from residents, so we really do value that. So please make sure to engage with us at any of those channels, whether that's the feedback.secondlife.com or in world by attending any of the user groups. Okay, um, we have just a kind of a collection of random questions here. So we'll go through these. Grumpity, finally, I get to ask you a question. When will mesh upload prices be reduced for premium plus members? Well, um, you get all the good questions to everyone else and you ask me about <laughs> pricing. I see how it is. Um, we are uh, looking at changes to mesh upload costs that will come with the work that the team's doing on GLT up import. Um, and once that work is in place, we're going to look at how pricing will be different for different subscription levels. Uh, in the meantime, though, the prices for 2K texture uploads have been changed. Um, those changes are live. Uh, and 2K texture uploads are free for premium plus. Wow, that's a reason to upgrade. Indeed, as as if there weren't a, a lot. Of as if there weren't enough in. reasons. There's a long list of reasons to upgrade to premium plus. Yeah. Um, Signal, we have another question here. Any plans to support popular VR headsets such as Oculus Quest 2 and 3 that are connected to the PC? Um, also, it would be really nice if after having the mobile version up and going, you try to make an SL app for the headsets that so that you don't even need to be connected to a PC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I would say that um, you know, I, I remember like Second Life had a, had a early VR prototype back in 2014 and I used it back then. It was like mind blowing. Um, you know, Second Life has all of this content and such detailed avatars and creative wild things going on that like using VR, uh, even in like prototype uh, form was like pretty cool. Um, we are exploring bringing VR back to Second Life. You know, it's too hard, too early to comment really on like specific hardware compatibility, but the intention is to bring like VR back and, um, you know, have the avatar be able to move around eventually and, you know, bring in joint streaming work that was part of like the Papa Tree project uh, from a little ways back. Um, you know, we want to uh, start off really simple. So like maybe the first release is that we're just gonna have, you know, some type of ability to put on a VR headset and look around. Like that might be the first thing that we release, but then we would like to build it out iteratively so that you know, eventually we'll have uh, a full VR experience. With regards to the mobile clients, uh, it's 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 an interesting idea. You know, I'd like to, you know, I, I don't know if we have a, uh, decision on that yet, but um, you know those headsets headsets can either be standalone um, or they can be connected to a PC for a desktop uh, to stream to it. So uh, those are both things that we're mulling over. Okay. Well, I'll be definitely interested to know what the decisions are with VR going forward. I know I haven't yet had the experience of trying a VR headset and I wear glasses, so I'm not even sure if I'm gonna be able to, but if Second Life ever gets to a point where it has a VR viewer, I'll probably give it a try, glasses or no. Yeah, you know, they actually make inserts, prescription inserts, which is what I use. I did, I did see that somewhere. So maybe one day, maybe one day I'll try. <laughs> And some of them, some of them do fit your glasses underneath them. I have to, sometimes what I do is cram my glasses into the headset. All right, let's see. Um, I guess we have gotten just about to the end of our questions and we are now to the topic where we got the very most questions from the community. And that was about the mobile app.
So Grumpity, this is all you. We're going to talk about mobile. And the first thing that we're going to ask, I'm going to ask you about is when is mobile going to be available? When, where, how, what, who, <laughs> everything you want to tell us about mobile, please, this is your chance. Well, mobile is uh, now entering its public beta phase, which means that it is actually coming to both iOS and Android um, now, and it is available on the App Store. However, it is limited to premium and premium plus subscribers only for the time being. Um, we are um, hoping to make it available to everyone really, really soon, of course. Um, but in the meantime, super excited. Uh, it is in beta. That means we still have a lot of work to do, um, but uh, this has been a long time coming and we're super grateful to everyone who has helped us test, uh, has submitted feedback and has given us um, a ton of help and support and information. And in this beta phase, we again, look forward to all of your help, support and feedback. Um, there is an FAQ published uh, that gives you a bunch of information, including how to give us more feedback. Um, also, uh, and this is uh, my favorite hope along with the rest of the team, um, if you have uh, suggestions for improvements, uh, concerns, complaints, uh, there's multiple ways to submit those. Um, if you give us horrible ratings on the app store, it might lead to not having a, a very good app on the app store and for people having a hard time discovering the app, et cetera. Um, it would also probably not be the best way for us to gather that feedback and act on it. Um, so, uh, Ready, set, go, but uh, don't go all at once. Um, we are uh, watching carefully and trying to scale up the infrastructure um, as all of you download the app and try to log in. So if, if people want to download the mobile viewer right now, what they need to do is go to either the Apple Store or the other one. <laughs> or the Play Store, but the Play Store, viewer, and, and they would be able to search for Second Life, and there's a viewer there that yes. they can download. Or uh, you can go to SecondLife.com/mobile, which is also just posted in chat, um, and you will see the download links uh, there on that page. I believe uh, the. Play Store on Android is still doing the updating because it takes about seven days for the app to be fully searchable. Um, so uh, in the meantime, you can find it through those links. Awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. So another, um, another question that we had was the mobile app update doesn't allow travel to adult areas. Um, this this seems restrictive, especially considering that a lot of LGBTQ venues are on adult regions. Is this something that will be addressed down the road? You know, um, we tried to address it uh, immediately. And in fact, that restriction has been removed on Android. However, adult regions still cannot be visited on iOS. Um, and I am happy if all of you want to have a word <laughs> with our overlords over at Apple. Um, but in the meantime, we are doing our best uh, to find solutions to allow you to access as much of Second Life as you would like on your mobile device. Um, the current solution uh, is this. On iOS, you are restricted to general and mature regions only. Uh, on Android, there's no such restriction at this time. So if, so I, if want I want to visit um, adult regions, I need to go out and get an Android phone. 
Yes, although you could also access them on desktop. <laughs> yes, yes, I could do that. All right, um, one more question. Considering the semi-recent licen licensing fiasco from Unity earlier this year, are there any concerns about potential rug pooling impacting the development and distribution of mobile viewer going forward? Uh, we certainly had some concerns at the time. Uh, our team has been in close communication with Unity. We've talked to them and we're confident that we've got this under control. So uh, this should not be a problem. Okay. Grumpity, is there anything else that you want to say um, about the mobile viewer or any other topic that maybe we haven't covered? but falls under your purview? Wow. Um, <laughs> there's a ton of things I want to say, uh, but uh, I also want to be mindful of the time. And I know that there are questions uh, pouring in uh, to, of course, Quiki's uh, IMs. Um, so I guess the one thing I really want to remind everyone about mobile, again, is that it is in beta uh, and uh, so please be gracious. I know that all of us would love to have all of Second Life on mobile, uh, but that is never going to be quite the thing. Uh, there will be things that you can do on mobile that you can't do on desktop. There will be things that you can only do on desktop. For example, I don't think content creators are ever really going to be creating things on mobile, um, but uh, I think um, there's a lot of dialogue that we look forward to having and continuing to have with the community um, as you explore Second Life on your device. Okay. All right. Well, um, everybody here, there are a lot of questions that have come in. So I will start with them and I will get through as, as many as I can. Um, Luke Rowley asks, hey, is there any plan for an official SL API that developers would be able to query to get basic information about avatars? Name to UUID, UUID to name, get the picture URL, et cetera. Uh, I, mean, I think I could take that, which we have some documentation on the wiki about the like official and unofficial web APIs. I think that's what the question is, is about like web APIs. Um, and we've considered that. I can't commit to, you know, like whether we're going to implement it or not, but I definitely would like to see our APIs modernized and, um, you know, kind of be really easy for developers to use. So we'll definitely consider uh, uh, some type of updated API structure. Okay. Um, the next question is from Felix Nagy, and I apologize, I, I'm reading names, and if I mess up a name, know that I gave it my best. Question, is there any indication of how much the new graphical features like 2K textures and PBR on terrain will affect frame rates? and performance for people, given some seem to be having some initial issues on just the inclusion of PBR in general. Yeah, so I think I can address it. It was, it was kind of like, are there plans to optimize? Right, yes, and we kind of already went over that. Yeah, I will say that um, the performance people are seeing, it does seem to be, uh, uh, like heterogeneous, like mixed, like some people are getting slightly better performance, some people are getting worse. It depends on your hardware, it depends on your machine, your operating system. Um, and we're getting some new hardware. We ordered some new PCs and um, Mac laptops to try testing and profiling on more types of mid-range hardware. Um, and in addition to like a low-end and high-end hardware, I would say that you know we do are working on a lot of the issues that have been reported both directly to us and through the support teams uh, with uh, Firestorm and other third-party developers. Um, so those have been really helpful. Uh, and uh, so I guess the short answer is 
yeah, we're working on uh, quite a few of the optimization efforts. Okay. Um, Anna Amore asks, she would love, she comments, she would love to have a dark mode option for the front page and marketplace. Is there a possibility of adding that? Uh, dark mode option on Second Life web pages. Uh, we have talked about it. We are interested in it. It is not in the roadmap for any time in the foreseeable future, but we are working on some UI updates to the various web properties that would make it easier for us to do that kind of thing going forward. And I think uh, internally we would like to have it as well. Okay. There are a lot of questions here, and what I'll do is I'm, I'm just going to say the questions and you all can jump in. I'm sorry that I can't really direct it. Some of them I might be able to, but I'm not sure about all of them. So um, full perm alpha, when can we expect a proper Linux viewer? And do you use the new feedback portal as roadmap? Uh, I can take that one. Um, Yes, we want to bring the Linux viewer back. And yes, uh, we are starting to use the feedback portal as a roadmap. Um, it's a bit of learning curve with these new tools and features in front of us. Um, can't give specific dates on the Linux viewer, but it's uh, it's 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 there and on the roadmap. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, re-enabling kind of the Linux viewer build was mostly um, the result of some contributions from the open source uh, contributors. So we really appreciate that. We have kind of like a, you know, it's not even alpha, it's like a nightly build of like the, the Linux viewer in one of our branches. Um, and so it definitely needs more to make it polished and ready to ship out to folks, but uh, we really appreciate those contributions. And one more from Full Perm Alpha, which I, I didn't realize was the resident's name until I read it a second time. Um, will the new mobile viewer be open source or closed source? I can jump in. I don't think we have any plans to open source it uh, right now. Uh, it's it's like in a really early stage. I mean, you know, we're in this kind of like beta stage of development, um, and uh, it is. I will say that it is built on top of some good open source technology that we are going to be. You know, as part of working with open source libraries, uh, we'll be contributing back upstream changes, um, and you know, helping those that helped us build the software. Um, Coffee Pancake asks, will there be a way to migrate existing in-world clothing from the current rigging system to GLTF, or will the process need to start over? Gosh. I think that would be a great topic to bring, at the, bring to the content creators uh, group to figure out whether they would have some ideas about the solutions there or be able to give an idea about how difficult that would be. Okay. Vic Morrington, Mornington asks, with OpenGL basically a platform that's not in maintenance mode and hasn't had any updates since 2017, um, will Linden Lab move the viewer fully into Vulkan in the future? I think the answer is yes, we are planning to do that. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff to do before we get there. Um, you know, the graphics team here really would like to do that to get to a modern API. Um, but we have a bunch of stuff to accomplish the roadmap before then. Okay, so something in the future. <laughs> yep, that cliche, yeah, coming soon, TM. All right, um, Sarah KB7 asks, will there be a viewer for colorblind people? Uh, that's a great question. 
I would love to explore that possibility. Uh, I would pile on and say uh, this is one of the reasons why on the Second Life viewer all of the UI is in black and white. It is to essentially uh, ensure the most uh, visibility for people who have various vision impairments, including people who may be colorblind. Um, so I, I don't know that uh, there's a lot that we can do to make the world look different, um, but it's a certainly a curious question and also one that uh, I think third party viewers could have a blast with if they wanted to. So just in going over a lot of these questions, it sounds like um, maybe these are things that people should follow up with on the feedback portal. Like if, if they want to bring it to your attention that this is something that they're interested in doing, would that be a good place if it if they haven't made a suggestion there instead of just asking the question here? But to Absolutely. also okay. yeah. you're totally right. Thank you. It's almost like we fed the suggestion to our interviewer, but in <laughs> fact it came naturally. Um yes, uh following up with the feedback portal is definitely a great idea. Um we are thrilled with the kind of the the amount and quality of feedback that's been coming in um and please keep them coming and also uh give us a little bit of grace because all of a sudden triages have become a, a huge part of my team's uh that's multiple teams uh lives and have taken up a lot of time uh, and we do have to balance uh, triaging incoming requests with working on them. Um, so uh, we love it. We love that you all are so engaged and have so much to offer us. So thank you. Okay. Are there any plans for some kind of link set data table viewer editor in the SL edit tools? It's a good topic for the server user group. I think it's come up before. Um, I think there are a lot of things that you can do with scripts that you should be able to do from the editor UI. Then there's some things um, that it may make sense to leave as something only scripts manipulate, like this link set data. Um, doesn't mean that people can't make tools that they could use to, you know, edit edit those data. But uh, I would say talk to talk to Ryder and and Simon and the server folks. Um, this question this from Tommy the Terrible, it's about the web RTC and he's asking, will people's IPs um, be protected, which we already talked about. And then he says, does the lab know if it will be using an MFU system or IP protection scheme? And I don't know if, if you have an answer for that yet, if you made that decision. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, if we had a, I would say bring that to the server group as well. I do know that the voice data is going through a relay and we have, um, you know, stun turn servers that uh, are used. And so there's never any direct P2P session. So your, your computer's identifying information should never be given out to another resident through the WebRTC system. Okay. I think there we go. There's we... an answer in chat. Okay. I think that um, we might have touched on this other one a bit as well. It's about a Lua implementation and wondering about a timeline for that, but also what kind of memory increase would it be from the 64K limit? And is there the possibility of a bump in LSL memory limit this year? So yeah, that's um, timeline wise, we would like to be, you know, getting more information into people's, uh, in front of people in the coming, you know, quarter or two. Um, it's a really huge project because we have to safely replace all mono scripts ideally with with um, the the Lua VM and also 
build out the uh, you know native Lua uh, script writing experience. So uh, the goal is early 2025 for you know like having this into some form where people can use it on uh, the beta grid and potentially Acme. Um, but that doesn't mean that there won't be like public information and ways to get engaged before then. Uh, I think there's some other questions there. Um, will there, what's going to happen to LSL after Lua is released? And will, um, if, if you release to Lua, you're mm -hmm. using Lua, will there be any further updates or focus on LSL? Yeah, interesting question. Um, I think we're still kind of figuring that out. And I just remembered the other important part of that question was memory is going to be expanded. Um, so the Lua scripts use less memory, which means as a script creator, you'll have more memory. So that's going to be really cool. Um, and it'll also be also run faster. Uh, and that's regardless of whether you're running LSL on the Lua VM or Lua on the Lua VM. Okay, all right. And and then they were also asking about memory as far as LSL. Is there going to be a memory increase on that? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think we have any plans to do that yet. Okay. But people, when Lua is implemented, will see uh, an increase just because Lua takes less. Yep. I mean, so not yeah, an increase, exactly right. but they'll have more power. Yeah, you'll be able to do more um, with uh, LSL on Lua or Lua on Lua. Okay. Is there any work being done on group chats or conference chats, which are notoriously unreliable? Uh, I was wondering where the where that question was going. Um, we are working on group chat. Um, both to enable WebRTC group chat sessions, group voice sessions. Um, we're also aware that there are some issues with reliability, particularly when you have large group chat sessions. So, uh, yeah, the answer is yes, we're working on them. Um, just a few more here. We have, are we going to see improvements to Havoc Engine and will we get the option for cloth, clothing physics? So yeah, we have talked about doing a Havoc upgrade, but um, that experience in the past has taken a very long time. We have to be incredibly careful while not breaking content. Um, any type of change, even if we make a subtle change to the hardware that Second Life runs on, you break content because there'll be differences in floating point math in Havoc and uh, upgrading Havoc would be something that we are considering. We haven't committed to yet. Definitely if we're talking about things that will require new physics capabilities like web, uh, like a, a GLTF, um, VR, uh, we need to be, we need to consider that. Uh, we just haven't committed to it yet. Okay. Um, is is there any looking into s into making Second Life playable on a console like a PlayStation or an Xbox? Hearing silence from the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, did you uh, want to take that one? Oh boy, that's that's a tough question. I mean, there's certainly limitations and, and restrictions there. Um, I I can't even begin to list the number of obstacles that would have to be overcome. Like but, natively, natively is one thing, right? But then like Steam VR, Steam Deck is like another option. But yeah. Well, I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, I'm like, you guys just did mobile. That, <laughs> that's pretty huge. So it seems like y'all ought to at least get to take a breath before you jump into trying to do another console. Um, 
last question. PBR enables mirrors, but can we have video screens like fixed second camera angle on a prim? For example, screens next to a stage showing the DJ close up. That would be too, so cool. Um, I, I would love to see that. It's not currently on the roadmap, uh, but you should totally take it to content creators user group. As you should, a lot of the other ideas that actually came up here and we haven't had a chance to get to. Um, we have regular user groups. We love it when people show up and there are lively conversations and discussions. Obviously, I understand that sometimes those user groups happen in the middle of your workday and you can't uh, exactly just drop everything and show up, um, which is why we have other ways of uh, getting your feedback. Um, like the feedback portal, um, and also, you know, hopefully soon you'll just be able to attend on mobile during your lunch break. Uh, so there's that. Um, yeah, I, I love the idea though. It would be super fun to watch a DJ during the performance. All right. Um, that's about all we have time for today. Thank you everybody for the questions that you sent in and for being here and listening. I think this has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed being here. I've learned a lot. Thank you to all of our guests, um, Kali, Signal, Grumpity, Syntax, and Kyle. Thank you for joining us today. Everybody here, I hope that you'll be able um, to come tomorrow. We are going to be joined by Senior Vice President of Product Operations and Marketing, Patch Linden, and other members of his team. Same place, same time, and we'll see you there. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much. This has been awesome, and you've been the most gracious host. Well, thank you for breaking me into this. This was my first time, mm -hmm. so I, I hope it wasn't painful. <laughs> I was a little yeah, nervous. It was amazing. <laughs> Not at all. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. It was a lot of fun. Thank you all. Bye for now. Happy birthday.